Welcome to the Learning Can't Wait podcast, a Full Mind production. At Full Mind, our vision is to ensure every child has access to an exceptional education. Each episode, we will be joined by pathfinders within and around the education space who are bringing about transformational change on behalf of deserving students. I am your host, Kaylee Spearbauer. Welcome back, everybody, to the Learning Can't Wait podcast. I know that the guests who listen to this podcast do not need a full introduction for the imitable guests I have on here today, but I am going to give you one nonetheless because I'm incredibly honored they've chosen to spend their time with us. I have Jean-Claude Brizard, the CEO and President of Digital Promise Global. Welcome to the podcast. Haley, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute honor, as I said a moment ago, to be able to interview someone with your experience in the field of education, the work you're doing today. Uh, I am particularly excited about all things innovation, and so I think we're going to have a good time chatting. Awesome. Looking forward to it. I'm going to start us off with my typical first question, which is, how did you come to be the personal and professional version of yourself? You know, it's a, it's a great question, and I'm getting to a place in my career where it's hard to separate the two, uh, what's professional, what's personal, because it's part of the same, the same passion. Um, I guess I would say the foundation goes back to my parents, um, who were both educators, um, who also, um, and with my grandfather, who was a, a classical musician, uh, conductor, I'm sorry, um, and uh all of them use their bully pulpit to fight against uh, injustice uh, in the country I was born in Haiti. Um, and, and that foundation around making sure there is a voice, making sure there is advocacy has always been there, which has allowed me to what I call controlled meandering. Um, so I didn't fall in, I didn't, choose to become a teacher. Um, you don't do what your parents do, you try to do something different. Uh, but since I did that, again, because of a, a push for my mom, I've always looked for opportunities. And when someone's bringing something to me, I take it. I, I drive my assistant crazy because I take all kinds of meetings. But that, those kinds of experiences, connections, uh, um, professional uh, experiences uh, have allowed me to understand and shape that kind of honeycomb that I think I am today. Um, and again, it's being open to all of those kinds of experiences really to help me. And I say one, one, one last thing on that is the, the, um, the mentoring, uh, the support of, of others uh, from days of being a teacher and the assistant principal who was my AP, who is still a very good friend today. Um, all these people also helped me understand how to navigate and meander. Um, and all these folks, I give a ton of credit to for who I am today. I love that term, controlled meandering. I, you know, it, it so well describes people that have a thread, but take different paths to follow that thread. So you've had time in your career as both a teacher, a school leader, a system leader, and you obviously just identified something that your parents really instilled in you and your family instilled in you, which is fighting injustice. How has that thread guided you to the role that you're currently in? You know, Hedy, I think it's, it's the kind of positions and jobs I've taken and where I've taken them. Uh, for example, my first teaching job in New York, I sort of landed there by accident. Um, Laos, well, great experience, formative experience, lousy experience at the same time. My first job was Rikers Island, teaching at Rikers in New York City. Um, but in every place I've been to, from the high school I moved to, from the middle school to the high school, where I became principal, et cetera, all have been the kind of schools that serve mostly kids who are poor, mostly kids who are at risk, mostly kids of kids of color. So it has like, driven me to these places. Uh, in fact, my last position before Digital Promise, I was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. First of all, the foundation has that kind of orientation. Um, it fit me really nicely. It, it lives by a model of impatient optimism, which is describes me to a T. And at the same time, the portfolio I held uh, in the president's office looked at education um, from P to workforce, P to post-secondary completion was initially the uh, the uh, the push, and looking for places in this country where folks are doing that kind of work really well, and for us to sort of fund and support again, looking at kids who are typically uh, uh, excluded from full participation where they were going. So every place I've been 
um, has, has been that. And, and our strategy now at Visual of Promise is, again, looking at kids who have been historically and systematically excluded. And we feel that if we over-index on that, if we, can, if we design for that, every child will benefit. What I really find intriguing about the lens you're using at Digital Promise is this focus on transformation and breakthrough, almost like disruptive technologies and how we make sure that people have access to them. Can you talk about just generally first, what does innovation mean to you as a leader in this organization? And how does that vision of innovation really translate for the work you do day to day? You know, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic question because um, Digital Promise at its core again, we came out of the U.S. government who created by an act of Congress, was designed for innovation. Um, so when you talk about innovation and digital promise, it's a bit like, what are you talking about? This is what we do. Hand in hand. Um, <laughs> it, go, it, goes, it goes hand in hand. Um, so we have a large bank of learning scientists who are experts in how kids learn. Um, so they do a ton of work around understanding neuroscience, understanding um, um uh, for example, the mental model of mathematics that kids bring to schools. Um, so that's the one big part of our organization. The other big part, of course, is how we can leverage technology as a means to getting to those kinds of places. But because of who we are, uh, we also have a large bank of practitioners because we don't just think and publish. We think, we publish, and we do. We demonstrate what this looks like in, in practice. Um, but at the same time, I've always been a believer, let's go back to, to one of my mentors who said to me many years ago, always try to remain as an outsider in your own organization. And what that means to me here at Digital Promise is even though every team I have have a, 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 an innovation bent, but we they tend to live within the zone of proximal development of the sector, of people, et cetera. What I think about is what is the next layer? Of innovation that we need to get to. If I can give you a concrete example as to what I mean, what that means, I was at the uh, place called the iLab uh, at the University of Washington uh, a few years ago, and I was walking out with a co-founder, and she showed me a brain scan, and said, "Do you know what that is?" And I said, "No idea." Um, and she says, "That's a child who is ready to learn to read." As you can tell that from the neuroscience, from the nuance, from that kind of brain scan, and she says, "Absolutely." Um, and while she was geeking out over the the, the, the the psychology of it all or the biology of it all, I kept thinking about, okay, what does that mean to how we design curriculum? What does it mean to how we design pedagogical practice? Uh, what does it mean for the teacher, for the principal, for the superintendent in the school? So that's the layer I like to live in. And for me, that's the kind of next generation innovation I think about as well, which is how do you think about those kinds of things? that can help you now understand the science of reading, for example, but takes you one layer be, be beyond that and pull. So I, I mean, I, I borrow a lot from Rebecca Winthrop at the uh, Brookings Institution, who talks about this idea of leapfrogging inequality. Um, so for me, that is a key, that if we can really leverage really well and then translate that to real stuff that happens in schools, there's a magic there around kind of leapfrogging around innovation, which I think about all of the time. That is so interesting. And I love the way that you, in your own answer here, have just provided both the philosophical and the practical, which is what you said that your organization is yes. all about. You're living yes. and breathing it, even in your reply. That's incredible. I, you know, I hear a story like that. And I too think about the incredible implications across the system you know, but I have this question about one thing I talk a lot about with guests is how different things are from state to state, right? We don't have a unified education system where everything comes from the top down. It's regionalized. Is that a challenge for your work or is that actually like something is an advantage where you can bring together ideas and help people grow off one another? How do you, how does digital promise kind of confront the regionalization of education? There's so many, so many uh, approaches to your question. I think it's both a massive challenge and an asset. Um, let, let, let me qualify that. We we work in nearly 300 school districts in the U.S. and 27 countries around the world. I can tell you, sitting with the Ministry of Education from X country, you can talk about a, an approach to practice, um, and you know that can cascade from the mothership down to all the component parts, right? A little easier for coherence. Um, but 
to give an example, when I sat with David Banks, the chancellor of New York City schools, when he was about to enter, a few of us said to him, the biggest asset you have in New York City is variability. You can find the best school and the worst school in the country right here in your city. You can find all kinds of practices right here in the city. The question is one of knowledge management, one of knowledge qualification, of understanding the difference in the variability and the variations, how to like harness that to inform other people's work. Um, so when I was in Chicago, as another example, um, as a CEO, we were very reluctant to mandate a uniform curriculum, although we know to best practice actually could be a good thing for a city that had a, a, a massive set of variations and expectations, et cetera. But at the same time, we we look for a different way of doing that, which is how do we create really high quality stuff, leveraging, for example, nationally board certified teachers and master teachers in creating, and then folks see it as an amazing example and they borrow from it. So to, to specifically to your question, um, I was in Lexington, Kentucky yesterday with our Global Cities Network. So we had Shanghai, Melbourne, we had uh, Bermuda, US Virgin Islands, right? Uh, Dallas, Denver, all in the same room. Um, and we're talking about practice. So one thing we discovered, well, not discovered, but we, we all know is that we are more alike than different. The challenges we face are very similar. And what's amazing about that kind of entourage, that kind of milieu is that you see the variations in approaches and that in itself informs the innovation that needs to happen. Um, so again, my point is that when you look at the League of Innovative Schools and when they come together from, gosh, 40, 45 states in the US, um, the challenges are not different, but what you see are amazing implementation efforts which vary a little bit, but informs the process and people they geek out on that kind of work. The challenge that we have next, frankly, is to take that kind of um, um, a network conversation and make it public um, to the world, which is our next layer of work. But again, the variation is an asset in the sense that you see different minds and different approaches uh, to the work. But at the same time too, it's challenging for implementation, um, especially if you're looking for uniform implementation. Sure. I think, I think that's, I mean, so real, right? You have both this benefit and this drawback to the regionalization of learning. No different than, I guess, as you would say, the leaders coming from various countries together who may be using the same research to inform what they advise their, their school districts to do. Uh, and yet they all do it differently because they're mm -hmm. in different countries with different programs and such. One piece of work that I know you're really excited about as it relates to innovation and cutting edge thinking is the recent introduction of the Future Lab. Can you tell a little bit about what this means, what you're hoping for, and what the expectations are for the impact of the Future Lab in the, in the future? Absolutely, Haley. First of all, we, 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 we launched this in partnership uh, with a number of organizations. One is very new called Learn, uh, a Learner Studio. And they're thinking about this idea of Horizon 3 innovation. They say we're living in Horizon 2. Um, that's one, one, one organization. We also partner with the Jobs for the Future, JFF, the base in Massachusetts. They have, uh, they, have a, they have a lab, the JFF lab. We're partnering with them as well, too. Uh, in that case, it's really around workforce innovation, education to employment innovations, et cetera. Um, we also partner with the Teach for America Reinvention Lab. We're thinking very deliberately about next, again, not about talent development necessarily, but next generation learning. So that kind of collaboration is an important one to highlight. But it goes back to our strategy. So every team that we have within Digital Promise, you know, um, are innovative. They live again within that zone of proximal development. Uh, but then having a small group of people or leader who is agitating and pulling, not just internally, but externally, to look at the next layer of things we need to, to think about is important. That team is allowed to go beyond the zone of proximal development and you say, what is the next thing that perhaps could be um, um, a leapfrog, right? Uh, to paraphrase Rebecca Winthrop, to, so a leapfrog to the kinds of challenges that we actually have. It could be existing within digital promise. Um, if you look at the leads profile, again, it goes back to who we are, she is a learning engineer, uh, which is that learning scientist expert, but you know also does and builds, right? So the idea of not just leveraging the brain trust of amazing researchers and practitioners, um, but also, and again, including our internal staff, but you talk about what is that next thing. So, but it still goes along the lines of what we do. It's around how kids learn. 
how do we get better at that, right? Uh, to really understand what that means, to really understand the idea of learner variability, to really understand the ideas around um, employment innovation. Um, so one of the things that we've been working on, for example, really leans on the ideas of ethnographic studies. So I talked about this idea of controlled meandering. How do you understand the professional journey of people and build systems around that? Um, so it's not just around academic learning, it's around the journey all the way to economic mobility. Um, but so this team is given um, the freedom to, to think expensively about the challenges that we have in education. Uh, again, education all the way to education and employment and how do we can build systems that can help us leapfrog some of the challenges that we have in front of us. That is so exciting. I actually had a reinvention lab uh, team member on the podcast and I remember it was Mike Yates and Mike and I talked about this idea of like agitation, which you're naming, and really thinking well beyond the scope of what exists right now. And I think that can be so hard for people. And yet I would also argue that the past year of changes in machine learning and AI and all these other, I wouldn't say they're sciences, but maybe they're sciences that people just generally weren't considering part of the future of teaching and learning that now are opens up a door, a completely huge door for, for innovation. And as you keep naming leapfrogging that no one could really put their head around before. Yeah. So, I mean, so um, what's interesting about AI or even uh, the kinds of, the kind of advanced technology is that it's not new and it's not new in education. I mean, the first thing showed up was Carnegie Learning back in 1975. So mm. AI has been around for a long time. Yes, it's grown hockey stick in the last couple of years. And OpenAI did a really good job of getting everyone to be obsessed <laughs> with AI, both the dystopian view and the innovation <laughs> view. That's true. Uh, I, I, am, I am quite bullish about what technology can do for education. I discovered that as a first year physics teacher in New York City, in Brooklyn, New York, where I was in a vocational high school and leveraging technology, these are not the kids who should be taking the New York State regions and doing well. I had near 100% pass every year. Excuse me. So like leaning and in, in, in leveraging technology. So I can give you tons of examples. Um, I did a, a panel yesterday, two days ago, I'm sorry, in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, but with a teacher of the year and an expert in AI uh, in Singapore and when I was uh, in the room talking about leveraging AI policy, practice, and workforce innovation. Uh, one of the things we talked about was looking at the individual education plan, the IEP, for kids who have special needs. Uh, right now, the system doesn't support, uh, meaning even the technology system is not supported very well. The IEP is a deficitly focused bureaucratic document, doesn't do anything for, for people. But there are ways of taking the document and making it more strength-based, more learning science focused. And if you add an AI chatbot for a teacher or a student, you can get very specific to the needs of a child. So in this case, um, we're looking at ADHD, we're looking at um, autism. You, you name the, the, the neurodiverse, the neurodiversity, and the question of how do we recreate the experiences for young people and for teachers, frankly, in getting very specific to the needs of those, those children, looking at leveraging the, the, the technology and frankly the science that we know on, on, on science of learning that we are actively working on. Again, another way of defogging and pushing uh, specifically for kids who, are, who have a kind of uh, no, 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 no divergent issues. But once you do that, Eli, you now create a structure that can benefit every single student. Uh, in any school. We talk about differentiation. We talk about getting personal, personalized. And we know from people like Todd Rose, there is no such thing as the average student, yet in, every, in education, everything is designed around the average student. So leveraging that kind of technology and work, you can get very specific to the individual need of a child. Although again, designed for special needs kids, but can serve every single student. I often say rising tides lift all ships. So if we're benefiting our most vulnerable population, there's benefit for all. I have to go back to your comment that AI isn't new. And I I like am distinctly remembering one of the first iterations of Microsoft Office and the, the little character Clippy yeah, that used Clippy. to pop up <laughs> and would use what you had written in the document to advise yeah. other things that you should look at. And I, I tell my colleagues all the time, like, 
Clippy was a bot. That's that's essentially yes. what Clippy was. Uh, and so I, I, I feel you. It, it's definitely not new. Um, but I love the idea of leveraging it. And, I, you know, IEPs, I have to tell you, it's something that I hadn't given a lot of thought about the structure of, candidly. I was mm -hmm. an educator for a very long time. I was a school leader. I myself have disabilities. Uh, and when I saw the way uh, a nature scientist writer described dyslexia through an mm -hmm. assets-based approach versus a deficit approach, my head exploded. It completely redesigned how I viewed not just dyslexia, but so many other aspects. And, and myself even receiving an, an ADHD diagnosis not even a year ago. Uh, when I learned about what the, you know, developmentally, environmentally, uh, proactive, pro-social behaviors of that condition were for me and how it's manifested in my own life. I thought back to all the learnings I had had previously of which there was just such a, as you said, a deficit-based approach. I think it could be profound. I know it yes. could be, will be profound, that, that type of work. Absolutely. But again, it comes back to making sure that our educators understand the role of technology and how to leverage it to support. I mean, people like us, have to be the design phase in supporting um, the kind of innovation. Um, but at the same time, it's an ed tech tool um, and making sure that we still understand the importance of the instructional framework, the high quality pedagogy, all that still matters. And frankly, all kinds of implications for pre-service for teachers, in-service, professional learning and professional development for teachers, all of it frankly matter a ton. You have like a 30,000 foot view of this space, of the school-based positions, brick and mortar. You have the view of the nonprofits supporting this work, of the uh, ed tech companies that are creating tools to aid leaders and teachers and students. How is the ecosystem evolving right now at, you know, both in relation to the past four years, which, you know, we, we all know we had a traumatic and challenging four years of in teaching and learning. And as we face the future of really embracing new technologies, even though they existed before, but really mm -hmm. embracing them, like where, where do you see the ecosystem system evolving over the next five to 10 years? It's a great question. So part of my to start first with a concern um, is I think our, our biggest challenge is one of coherence. Uh, you got lots of pieces doing things, um, making sure it it comes together um, in a way that serves our, our children, I think is really important. Um, so lots of activities, lots of folks from funders to government talking about next generation innovation. One of the things I'm most excited about and I hope we get IPED passes at the federal level is the NEED Act, N-E-E-D Act, um, which is going to focus on, if you, if you know DARPA, and how DAPA helped with the military. The, the GPS is one of the most more famous outgrowth of, of DAPA. It, it the same amount of money has not been spent on educational research. So you think about that, maybe the next five to 10 years, that would have passed. The kinds of tools and solutions and different frameworks for education, I think is gonna be really exciting. Um, and the Institute, Institute for Education Sciences, part of the US Department of Education, are thinking through that very, very, very deeply. So one, I think the science, of the, this, the research and development piece is going to gain steam because so far it's bipartisan that if Congress can get functional, we're going to get this thing through. The other, frankly, um, you get both worry and, and opportunity with the advances of technology and AI, uh, you're going to see, I think, next generation uh, data analytics, uh, predictive analytics, that really helps a teacher understand um, both the qualitative and the quantitative, right? To paint a picture of a child so the interventions can be targeted appropriately. Again, if we're not careful, it can only benefit maybe only some kids and not every kid. Another thing that I'm excited about that we're working on too is again, maybe on the future of work orientation on computational thinking. Um, so what that says very simply is that moving away from teaching kids coding right, how to code to instead understand algorithmic thinking. Um, so then, because AI is already coding, right? So I understand how to debug when something goes wrong, is not working properly. Can you manage the machine? Can you be in control of the machine? By the way, pilots, I'm a commercial pilot. So pilots are already doing that, right? They're managing the technology. And if you take up, if, if you fly a plane, it's all tech, it's AI all around you, but they're in, they're in control, they're in charge. 
So computational thinking skills are the kinds of future skills kids, well, present skills kids need to do really well. So I see all kinds of employment innovation coming. One more, I mean, there's so many more, but I'll give you one more I'm really excited about. It's a, a, a heavy movement that was launched by the U.S. Chamber Foundation. Uh, now, now, commerce, everyone's on board, and we're a big part of it, on the learning and employment record. So a redesign of the record. Right now, the transcript, the student record is a one, maybe two-dimensional construct. Doesn't tell you anything about a person. Does not honor all learning. Uh, but you have an LER, the learning and employment record, which is digital in nature, where you can put any credential, would be micro, a badge, or diploma, right? Um, you can paint the picture, can you can meander, right? And pull your learning and then cobble what you want for a position you see moving down the road. Um, so that for me really is exciting because it brings, it allows for competency-based education to really take hold. It allows for a person to have agency on their record. So right now, if you want a copy of college transcript, you gotta go, and pay money to get you want your high school high school transcript. Good luck with that, right? It's a microfish somewhere. It's <laughs> sitting in a, in a basement. But you think about that kind of stuff living um, um, electronically in your pocket, uh, and you have agency and control over that. That for me is is an amazing uh, near term future that is coming, frankly, to America and to the world. The first time I heard about this initiative that that you're working very closely on, my my immediate reaction, which I think goes unstated because it's the premise of why you've built it and why you're working on this, is the is the incredibly powerful impact it has on equity and the ability for also students to follow pathways that match their skills and interests in a way that current transcripts don't allow for. I think about my my own husband is an artist and like school just did not work for him until he discovered art. And all the pieces related to art. Um, and that, you know, his transcript didn't reflect the true like genius and talent that he is, if I do say so myself. But until he really discovered what his skills aligned to and his passions were, and there's so many children for whom that's true, that current transcripts don't really reflect the dimensionality of an individual, but rather a structured system that was that was built ages ago and has continued onward without real iteration or change. Can I give you an example? Yes, I heard this yesterday morning with a bunch of uh, high school kids in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, who across the state build a coalition to redesign the school report card uh, to really inform young people in their choice of school. Uh, it's a brilliant document and it really elevates in a powerful way student voice, right? Uh, I mean, I wish I could show, could show it to the audience. It really is amazing. But at the same time, this young person was telling us that uh, her, her AP history, she's got to run to go to the AP history, history test so she doesn't fail it. And I'm saying, oh my God, what she is doing in really influencing policy, not just Kentucky, but the country, she and her friends have raised millions to support this work, both local foundations and national foundations. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is social studies in, in its essence. Um, <laughs> And, 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 and but to see that that skill not recognized is my point, right? So she should get a micro credential for that. She should be part of a learner record. Instead, she may have to in an essay somewhere in a college application explain what she was doing. But it should be a recognized credential for that kind of power. And by the way, I mean she. I mean it was she and it was three, four kids very poised, well-spoken in front of like 30 adults <laughs> explaining this from across the world, right? Um, it was the best thing I've seen in years. Um, and to see that skill not get the kind of recognition it deserves, for me, pains me because that is really what school, what education, what learning is is all about. And also it's what drives student motivation, them yes. being involved in projects. And what, what we know about kids and humans in general is that the yes. more motivated they are personally about work or a project or connected they feel, the longer they can endure the challenges, the the, the yes. difficulties that are before them. What What is better than that to have kids pursuing work that they are passionate about that makes Absolutely. a difference for others? I love that. Jean-Claude, I am devastated to be at the end of our time to get today because I feel like we could record 
hundreds more episodes based off of the, the nuggets here, but I know that there are many places and spaces our listeners can find more of what you do, your work, your team, and the incredible, powerful work of Digital Promise. But I have to I have to wrap this up uh, and I have to ask you my final question, which is you've been a teacher, you see teachers every day. What advice would you give a new teacher starting their career? Yeah, hey, great question. So I, 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 I'll lean on two teachers I've met in the last four months. Um, one is the Utah Teacher of the Year. And of course, yesterday, two days ago, sorry, the Kentucky Teacher of the Year. And these are like one of the middle folks. They're not like superhuman, you know? Um, but what they have done is, it goes back to, my, to your first question, is they've opened themselves to massive kinds of experiences. The one two days ago talked about how he leverages AI in his classroom and gave us concrete example how he has elevated his pedagogy in his assessment, um, leveraging the technology. So what I would say to a first year teacher, don't get locked into your classroom um, and think that the world is four walls around you. Open yourself to the kinds of professional learning and experience. You know, be hungry to learn. Um, if you, if your, your district will allow you, go to conferences, go to places, look for opportunities for the network. Um, I'll tell you, that's been my greatest asset over the last 35 years in this business is my network. Um, I, 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 I cherish the opportunity to meet and talk to educators from around the world, to learn. And I say to people, I became a much better teacher when I became a principal because I got to see a lot of teachers teach. I became a much better principal when I became a superintendent because I saw a lot of principals lead their schools. Uh, so that kind of experience is seeing and understanding others beyond the textbook. I think I would say, go for that. And you'll be amazed at what you're actually learning about the profession. That is wonderful advice. And really it matches with so much of what you've shared here today about bringing people together and learning from one another. Jean-Claude, I am so grateful that your assistant still permits that controlled meandering because that's how we met. And I'm grateful to have you in my orbit and to learn from you and what you've been doing and the work that you've accomplished with your team. Thank you so much for being on the Learning Can't Wait podcast today. Hey, Haley, thank you so much. And thanks for being part of my network. Yes, of course. Yeah. And thank you to everybody who tuned in today. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Learning Can't Wait podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and share this episode. Be the first to know when we have a new episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or have a suggestion for an episode, email us at podcast at fullmindlearning.com.